precisely to make it more and more difficult for any single party to command free quarter seats, free quarter majority. So we should not underestimate the very important decision that we are about to take. Because what we will do at the moment of voting will buy not only us, but probably many generations to come. And that is why we have to be absolutely convinced that what we're doing today is an improvement in our democratic system. Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, any bill on electoral reform requires consensus. It requires broad-based support of all, I repeat, all components of our rainbow nation. And after three days of debate, listening to people from, elder members from both sides of the house, it is clear that there is no consensus. It is clear that today, the government who has 45 MPs, even assuming that all 45 MPs vote in favor, because certain MPs have left the doubt that maybe they're not going to vote, but even assuming that all MP from the MSM, from the ML, from Rodrigue's party, from the defectors, even if they all vote in favor, they have only 45 seats, 45 votes. And you need 52 votes to get this bill. So when you know you have only 45, bill, uh, 45 votes and you need 52, what do you do? You talk, you discuss, you compromise. But what has this government done? We know as far back as September, 21st September 2018, after the Honorable Prime Minister did his press conference and announced to the public what he has in mind in terms of electoral reform. That was live. Unlike what Honorable Boda said, we commended, but not just the MMM. I know that most political parties, not even political parties, members of civil societies express their views. We did it loud and clear on the press conference that we do not agree with what is being proposed. We stated that, you know, this is not what the MMM wants. And we said it so, that we are not agreeable with the number of seats allocated to PR because it's too low, and we're not agreeable with this, uh, although Beros used the term accordion, this thing about adding six to 10 MPs to fix any disbalance which results from the allocation of PR seats. And we stated what was our position. Back in 2014, our position that it was that we needed 20 PR plus eight to replace the best user, to subsume the best user. After compromising with the Labour Party, we reduced that figure to 20, 14 on the PR and six on the system to subsume the best user system. So we repeated that. Our proposal was, you know, a minimum of 20 PR seats while ensuring that all the components of our rainbow nation is fairly and adequately represented by the new bill. And this has not changed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir. And when we see the communique of cabinet on 28 September 2018, The cabinet does repeat whatever the honorable deputy, uh, honorable, uh, honorable prime minister said, and still said that despite whatever comments the opposition had been making, they're going to go ahead with the bill. And when this bill was presented before this house, under certificate of urgency, giving MPs only a few days to read it and to debate it, the Honourable Prime Minister know that what he is proposing today has been criticised by, by the opposition, has been rejected since September 2018. And yet, not an iota of change. 
Not an iota of change in what they had announced in September, which we have said we have already rejected. And now today, they want to make, it be, to make the population believe that it is the MMM who is unreasonable and not voting this, this bill. We tell the government, we don't agree. We have fundamental differences with you. And instead of proposing amendment, they come forward with the same bill, same wording, knowing that they don't command a majority. So why are they coming with this bill when they know that they were not going to secure the majority of 52? I have asked myself and many other people, does the government genuinely want electoral change? Do they genuinely want to change a system that has benefited them so far? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I listened carefully to Honorable Minister Mentor. We may not agree with what Honorable Minister Mentor say all the time. Some of us may think that he's too conservative. Some may call him retrograde. Honorable Paul Bayer-Roger even referred to him as having an obsession mythique with the, pro the problems in Rodri and their experience with proportional representation. But at least he has the courage of his conviction. He has the courage of his conviction. He's always believed in first part of the post, and he will always believe in that system, a system that has served him well. And if it was left to him alone, he would not change the system. And this is why, even if this bill is proposing to, do, to modify the first part of the post system by adding a dose of proportional representation, what is the bill also doing immediately? Whatever they're giving in one hand, they're taking back in the other hand. This is exactly what they're doing. This is what clause 8.2 of the uh, proposed constitutional amendment is saying in very clear words. If after the allocation of a PR seat, the number of seats, the difference between the number of seats of the majority party and the minority party, or the, and the second loser, is increased or decrease, then six to ten additional MPs would be designated by the leaders to restore mathematically that difference. So you can't be more clearer than this. We don't want to change. If we are forced to change, okay, we'll change it, we'll give you PRC, but immediately we'll take it back to where it was before giving you PRC. And then what the point of giving you PRC? Isn't the whole point about proportional representation to cure an unfairness in the system, to cure an imbalance that results from third parts of the post with a party being disproportionately advantaged? 50% of seats of votes giving them 70, 80% of votes and of seats. Isn't the BRC, uh, the first part of the post system, a system that unfairly discriminates against another party who may have got 30, 40% of votes, but only 10, 20% of seats? Isn't it precisely to correct this imbalance that we have the proportional representation? And let me quote Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir how this was ably put in the report of the Select Committee on the introduction of a measure of proportional representation in our electoral system, commonly known as the Colin Davilou report, because he chaired it, the Select Committee. What did that committee say at paragraph 6.2? At the end of the day, we need to know what we want. It does appear incongruous to clamor against the unfairness of the present system. And we agree that we require a dose of PR to mitigate the rigors of the system. We ought therefore, we ought not therefore, we ought not therefore to be surprised when a dose of proportional representation precisely achieves these results. This is what the select committee says. If we believe that the first part system creates an unfairness and that the proportion, a dose of proportionate representation is meant to 
partially cure this unfairness. So why should we be surprised when the doers of proportional representation does precisely this? And this is where I don't understand the government. All the members who have intervened on the other side have said that it is unfair. Post 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 is unfair. We need a dose of proportional representation. We need to reduce this unfairness. And then they all agree with uh, these additional seats to nullify any impact with the allocation of PR seats may have on the election results. So it is, you know, like uh, my, my kids usually, when they are among themselves, they like to say, you know, donner c'est donner, reprendre c'est voler. Donner c'est donner, reprendre c'est voler. You've given PR seats, and then you're taking it back for additional seats. This is why, at the SMM, we say it's a non-reform. C'est une non-reform. Because you exa you're not doing any reform by adding these additional seats. And, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Minister Mentor, several ministers on the other side, and we just heard Honorable Boda just now, trying to justify this non-reform by repeating ad nauseam, ad infinitum, that the first past the post ensure stability. It ensures stability, therefore, we need strong, stable government, and we should not allow the PR to have any negative impact on the stability of the government. Well, I was very fortunate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, 15, 20 years now ago, I studied, I read politics and law. And I studied political system as part of the core of my politics subject. And back then, and I went back to my books to check whether I was wrong. Back then and still now, there is nothing inherent in the first past the post system that ensure political stability. It is simply just not true. First past system has resulted in hung parliament. We've seen what is happening in England, what happened in England twice. They had to do a coalition with the, the Lib Dem and then had to fall apart. And we see on the other side, you know, even UK now going on PR to elect its representatives on the European Union. That's on one side of the spectrum. But we have also on the other side of the spectrum, countries who have adopted proportional representation system in one way or the other and had very stable governments. One example is South Africa, who has a, an almost pure PR system and the NC is ruling the country since uh, apartheid without any uh, major uh, upheaval in the system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, in fact, according to ACE Electoral Knowledge Network, which is the largest online resource on elections and electoral system, there are 12 main electoral systems currently used in the world. 92 countries use, the first part, uh, use plurality voting, which include first past the post, but also variation. For example, in France, they have les deux tours, and in Madax also. 92, so use the plurality voting. But 73 countries use some sort of proportional representation. 29 have mixed system combining plurality and PR, and there are six others. So clearly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, if really the first post, the post was ensuring political stability, all the other countries also who are using some PR of some sort would have gone with the first part of the post. No, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, it is not the first part of the post that has assured stability in this country. It is the political alliances. The political alliance, the first part of the, first part of the post system forces pre-electoral alliance. And that is what results in a stable government, not the system itself. It is 
the alliance, the pre-electoral alliance. It favors a two-corner fight. <coughs> and since independence, we say Deputy Speaker, so we all know there has been only one, two, three-corner fight in this country. That was in 1976. 1976, when the MMM won 30 seats, Labour Party with CEM won 25 seats, PMSD won seven seats, including two Rom Rodrigues. Of the allocation of best losers, MMM had 34 MPs, Labour CM 28, PMSD 8 MPs. The MMM won fair and square. But what did the Labour Party and the PMSD do? They formed a coalition and denied MMM the right to govern. So this first past the post system that is being hailed like the Holy Grail in this country has resulted in 1976 with the party having obtained the greatest number of votes, with the party having obtained the greatest number of seats, with the party having the most popular support being denied the right to govern, the legitimate right to govern. This is the first part of the post. It doesn't ensure stability. And since then, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what have we seen? No one has dared contest the election alone, except for the MMM. No one. And let me say now, clear to the nation, despite what Honorable Kavi Ramano may think, if we have to do it again, if MMM has to go alone to the election, we'll do it. MSM never. MSM, you have to clap. You have to clap, Honorable Prime Minister. You are totally right to clap. You have already, you have totally right. You are totally right to applaud. Because the MSM, you have ruled this country, Père et Fils, for decades. Never once in your history, never once in your history have you had the courage to stay and face the electorate alone. Never. So that's why you have to upload. You're right to upload. Yes. Yes, I don't, I don't blame you. I don't blame you, Honorable Minister Mentor. This is precisely what I'm saying. This system, this system has served the MSM well by making sure that they are each time returning power by having political alliance. And as Honorable Minister Mentor said, he's practical. There's no problem compromising as long as, you know, they are the prime minister, you know, then all thing is negotiable. We are practical. I don't blame them for, for, for that. Uh, this is another matter. This is, this is another matter. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the MSM has run this country for so many years, for so many decades. It has never brought any electoral reform. When the MMM was in power with the MSM between 2000 and 2005, we had the Sachs Commission on Constitutional and Electoral Reform, which recommended electoral reform. We had a select committee of the assembly chaired by the Honorable Ivan Colin Davoulou, who was then in the MMM, to implement the recommendation of the Sachs Commission. The select committee of which Honorable Balamudi and Honorable uh, Dukan Le Schumann were also members, they submitted their report to the speaker as far back as February 2004. The select committee drafted the amendment to be brought to the constitution. The MMM MSM government had the required three quarter majority to have that implemented. But were we able to bring constitutional amendments? The MMM were all for it. Was the MSM ready for it? I, I, I remember this sentence. I was still young, I was not in active politics, but I still remember the sentence that made the, the news what the former, the then Attorney General state, stated. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. 
If a system has worked so well for us, is working so well for us, why should we change it? Why change a winning formula? If you, as long as you're a winner, okay. What about all the losers? What about the hundreds of thousands of electors of these countries whose vote are wasted because their vote is not represented in parliament? No, we don't. We are practical. Practical. And the, the, Labour, the Labour Party is no better. They also did not introduce any bill on uh, political reform. In fact, in 2014, when they proposed and voted the constitutional amendment to do away with the requirement for a candidate to declare his community, the, what they call the mini amendment, let it be remembered, it is the MMM, it is Paul Béranger who first came with this formula to amend, they call it the mini amendment, but to amend the constitution, replacing Charles by May so that someone, a candidate, does not have to declare his community. The PMSD? N'en parlons pas. Ils sont plus intéressés à se faire belle, jolie mamzelle, to write on the back of the next major party. And I don't blame them. Don't get me wrong, I don't blame them. They, they, are, they are so used to what in our good old Creole we say, les cinq sous qui manquent pour faire une roupie. And I'm criticizing them. They are used to pre-electoral to, to pre alliance. They know that is what being practical, Honorable Minister Mentero. They know that on their own strength, they will not rally sufficient support to have an MP elected. Therefore, what they do, you know, maquillage, Zoli, and then piggyback on a uh, buying wagon. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, you can understand the deep sense of anger that we honorable members from the MMM had to endure listening to honorable Sinatambu on Saturday and then honorable Jumai trying to blame us for not supporting the electoral reform when in truth and in fact, MMM is probably the only political party who has ever since 1986 fought for electoral reform. And how wicked to assert that what separates the government from the MMM is just a question of numbers. No, Mr. DP Speaker, it's not a question of numbers. We have compromised in the past on numbers. We can pro compromise on numbers. Numbers is not an issue. Of course, we would want to have the maximum number of PR. And really, Sachs, the Commission Sachs recommended 30 members of proportional representation. We're not going as, you know, higher past 30. We have asked for 20. But there are more fundamental issues. Honorable Boda is right to say that one of the big differences between the MMM and the uh, MSM is on the mode for allocation of those uh, PR seats. We in the MMM have always favored the compulsory, the compensatory formula which is what was recommended by Sachs Model C, and which is also, incidentally, what was recommended by the Select Committee, chaired by Honorable Colin Davidou, a formula in which, in the word of the Sachs Commission, and I quote, would allow for a greater degree of fairness while still heavily favoring stability. So what we're talking about, stability, this is also preserved by the compensatory formula. The select committee went further at, at paragraph 104 of its report, and, and I quote, the system is not a complicated system, except if one stubbornly refuses to understand it. I don't know who he had in mind when he says someone who stubbornly you know, refuses to understand it, but this is what the committee says. And now, today, what we are proposing in this bill is not the compensatory formula, it is the parallel for system. The same parallel system that was rejected both by the Sachs Commission and by the Select Committee. This is what the Select Committee had to say about the parallel system at paragraph 119 of the report, and I quote, Mauritius must decide whether it wishes to have a stable government with fair representation or whether it wants to perpetuate 
the present system with just a token representation. The people want to see their votes represented in Parliament. The compensatory formula is by itself a compromise between first past the post and strict PR. The parallel system is only a way of providing us with the beginning of a debate, but not with a solution to the problem. I totally, entirely agree with what was stated by the committee. What we're having today is not a solution to our problem. It is only the beginning of a debate. And I hope that this debate evolves and it evolves to a solution to the problem of first past the post. And it doesn't remain at the level of debate only. Very strong language used to reject the parallel mode of allocating uh, PR seats. And this is why, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, after reading this report, I really would have expected Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, when he intervened on Friday on this bill, I really wanted him to tell us why he changed his mind. Why he had felt, he and other members of the company, committee, had felt so strongly against the parallel system, and today he is defending it all out, even trying to convince us to become convert like him, even telling us, you know, come, join the back and I've changed. Yes, I know you've changed, but why should we change? We believe that genuinely the compensatory method is better than the parallel method. And as I have stated when I started my intervention, if today we adopt a parallel system of allocation of PR seats, God knows when we'll be able to change that system. God knows when we'll have three-quarter majority in its house to change what we are doing today. So, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, there are fundamental differences. But having said that, having said that, the MMM, some of us, most of us, believe that something is better than nothing. Something is better than nothing. Some dose of proportional representation is better than nothing. Adopting the parallel mode of allocation of PR with all its shortcomings, instead of the compensatory mode of allocation, as recommended by the Sachs Committee and the Select Committee, is better than no dose of proportional representation. And we would have considered, and this is why a lot of criticism has been leveled a lot of uh, faux procès, ITFE or MMM, when the Honorable Paul Béranger stated that we are considering to vote under protest. That is what he had in mind. If you come up with an electoral reform, we may not entirely agree with it, but if at least it's improved on what we have, we will consider voting it under protest. That is why on the PR issue, there is room for compromise. But where there is no room for compromise is we in the MMM would never vote for an electoral system which does not ensure a fair and adequate representation of all the components of our rainbow nation. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we should be proud of our diversity our diversity is not a weakness, it's our strength. People fly all over the world to see this harmony. Just like in the Rainbow Nation, you can see colors standing next to each other and doing a beautiful whole. Just like these communities, one next to the other in Mauritius, making a beautiful whole. And the other day, someone was asking me, you know, when we travel, we meet other people, and there is this reception that you're invited in, and they ask you to wear a national dress. And always I wear a suit. So they ask me, what is a national dress? What should I say? Is it a sari? Is it a kurta? Is it a flowery shirt? Is it a suit? I say, it's all of it. When they ask me, what is my national dish? Is it dal puri? Is it briyani? Is it rugai? Is it uh, minfria? 
It's all of it. That is the beauty of Mauritius. This harmony, this mixture of colors. So if we agree that the diversity that we have is our strength, so why can't we agree that any political system should reflect that diversity in our nation? This is why I repeat it. The MMM will never compromise until it is satisfied that any electoral reform that is presented before this House will ensure a fair and adequate representation of all, call it section of the population, call it component of the population, call it community of, the, of, of Mauritius. And it is not just today that we're taking this stand. This stand has been in the forefront of anyone who proposed electoral system to Mauritius, as far back as 1948. Why 1948? Because as Honorable Béranger explained, 1948, the first true election, Dine de Seignon, MMM, uh, the Muslim filed five candidates, Muslim candidates. No one is returned. No Muslim is returned as elected member. And it created an uproar. I know people who was there, who went to, you know, demonstrate, who attended. I know people have explained to me what was the tension. And that is why the colonial government in, uh, in those days made sure that any uh, proposal for electoral system should ensure a fair and uh, uh, adequate representation. And that was entrenched also, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, in the London Agreement of 1957. The second principle, right, and I quote, any system of voting should provide an adequate opportunity for all the main sections of opinion in Mauritius to elect their representative to the Legislative Council in numbers broadly corresponding to their own weight in the community. One year later, Sir Malcolm Trust and Eve advocated 41 party, a uh, one member constituency, but also he insisted that there should be 12, up to 12 additional members to be nominated by the Governor, Governor General. And Sir uh, Malcolm Trustam even wrote to the Governor and told him, and I quote, to exercise his power of appointment in such a way that each of the three main sections of the population are so far as possible represented in the Legislative Council in number broadly corresponding to their proportion of the population as a whole. After Tustamir, 1965, there is a Lancaster House conference called by the Colonial Secretary Sir Anthony Greenwood. This time, there is no agreement. Why? Because the Muslim community asked for separate ballot, separate voting lists, separate resource seats, for themselves. 1966, Banwell Report, first referred to, first time referred to the term best loser. The Banwell Report was also rejected because it uh, proposed some sort of uh, uh, corrective variables, which is a sort of proportional representation that enables parties that have received more than 25% of votes to get additional seats to make their total equal to at least 25% of seats in Parliament. So this dose of proportional representation was represented by, uh, you know, back in 1966. And then after Banwell, we've had the uh, Johnston House report, and he came up with the best user system as it is today. Now, why did John, Mr. Johnston House devise the best user system, which was accepted by all political parties? Only one reason, to ensure a fair and adequate representation of all communities. And today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, this is entrenched in our Constitution. It is at paragraph 5 of the first schedule. In order to ensure a fair and adequate representation of all of each community, there shall be eight seats in the assembly, additional to the 62 seats for member. 
in order to ensure a fair and adequate representation of each community. This is what is entrenched in our constitution. This is the constitutional safeguard. This is the safety net. And what is this bill doing today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir? It is precisely repealing that first schedule. It is precisely repe repealing that section of the constitution, the only section of the constitution which expressly provide that you need to ensure a fair and adequate representation of each community. And the government is surprised that there is an outcry. The government is surprised that the MMM is not supporting this bill. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, I listened carefully to the Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Mr. Mento and the others. This seems to suggest that you know, the present system would ensure a fair and adequate representation. But I'd like to be proven wrong. I'd like Honorable Ratna, who is intervening after me, to show me where, because he's very good at doing this, show me where in the proposed, in the bill that is before this House, where is it stated, for example, that in choosing the 12 PR seats, we need to ensure a fair and adequate representation of every section of the, of the of Mauritius. I want him to show me where it is stated that in choosing the six to 10 additional MPs, additional seats, that the leader needs to ensure a fair and adequate representation of all components of the rainbow nation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, the cabinet paper, the cabinet, uh, uh, cabinet decision of 28 September 2018 has a whole paragraph dedicated to this issue. So it was very, it was very alive in the mind of cabinet, of the ministers who attended cabinet on 28 September 2018. It was very live in their mind that there is a need to reassure all minorities, all communities. And this is what the, cab the cabinet paper reads. The proposed reform ensures that all minorities are adequately represented in the National Assembly. Party leaders will be entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring that PR lists provide for broad-based and inclusive representation. It stands to reason that leaders would feel candidates who are likely to correct any underrepresentation. This is what cabinet had agreed. Cabinet agreed that party leaders will be entrusted with the responsibility of ensuring that PR lists provide for broad-based and inclusive representation. What happened between the time cabinet adopted this and the bill was presented? What happened to the requirement that the, the party leaders must ensure broad-based and inclusive representation? Why was it thrown away? Practical? Being practical? Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, the honorable members, the honorable ministers and members of the MSN want us to put the trust in political leaders to ensure a fair and adequate representation of all minorities, of all communities, to ensure an inclusive, to ensure an <coughs> inclusive, broad-based and inclusive representation without anywhere in the law, in the bill, setting the criteria which the political leaders need to apply when choosing the PR when appointing the additional members. And they are surprised. And they are surprised that people don't want to support this bill out there. Why do people out there don't want to trust political leaders? What happened in 1953? 1953, first time a Muslim is elected. First time, 
Sir Abdul Razak Mohamed is elected. And then slimest by the shortest of majority, slimest of majority over his party comrade, Alex Boudjari. We're not talking about an opponent. We're talking about someone from his own party standing as candidate. He was elected. He beat Alex Boudjari. Three, and then they recounted it to five. <coughs> he was then not member of Comité d'Action Musulmane. He was not CIM like uh, Honorable Alin Gayan was reading about CIM. He became CIM because precisely what happened at that election. What did his leader do? What did the leader of Parti Mauricien do? What did Kenik do? He asked for a recount. He asked for a recount. Can you imagine what Abdul Razak Mohamed felt? Can you imagine what the supporters felt? Can you imagine what the whole Muslim community felt? And then we're surprised that people don't trust political leaders. I'm not saying that they're right in not trusting. But history is not on their side. What happened to 1983? What happened to Kadir Bayat? Lake Kadir Bayat, together with Paul Béranger and Anur Jagdat, he was not Sir yet, they formed the triumvirate, the triumvirate of MMM, the Tête After the 1982 election, they were together in government. 1983, there was a breakup. Out of allegiance to Anur Jagdat, Kadir Bayat left the MMM, joined Anur Jagdat and formed the MSM founder of the MSM party. He left his constituency number two, went and came to stand as candidate in number 10, and he got elected. Kadir Bayad got elected. But during the campaign, what was the theme of the campaign? He will become the deputy prime minister. And what happened after the election? What happened after the election? It was Sir Gaëtan Duval who became deputy prime minister. And you want people today to have faith in all political leaders? They have faith in some political leaders, but not all of them. What happened in 1987? 1987, after the general election, the MSM Labour Party gets one MP elected, again in constituency number 10, Honorable Aziz Asghari. And then through best loser, they have an additional seat allocated to Honorable Shokhat Ali Sudan. Yeah, people may be surprised, but as far back as 1987, Honorable Sudan was already a member of parliament. So the MSM Labour government had two members from the Muslim population, from the Muslim community. Yet, the leader who chooses his cabinet, the leader of the party, did not think fit to have any member of the Muslim community in cabinet. And today we are surprised that some people out there don't trust political leaders. More closer to us, we said the PC. What happened in 2014 in the general election? What happened? L'Alliance Les Peuples, gouvernée pour le peuple avec le peuple, manifeste électoral, novembre 2014. Paragraph 5. Le système de best loser sera maintenu. They campaigned on it. They went village to village, town to town, houses to houses, targeting a particular community. And what did they do? What did they say? I have it. It's on the internet. Now with the internet, you know, you can have everything. I can still see members from the MSN saying, I won't say name because there was more than one person. I don't like to point figures at only one person because there are most of the people of the Muslim community of the MSN use the same language. What they say? The choice is clear. On the one hand, you have the MMM Labour Party. He's going to abolish Bessou's system, a system that you know has served us well, a system that we receive from Abdul Alim Siddiqui, a secret system. On the one hand, you have MMM, Labour Party, who's going to get rid of our secret Bessouza system. And on the other hand, you would have Alliance Les Peuples, MSM, Mouvement Militaire, 
we are going to preserve the system. So the choice is clear. Who do you vote? And they went houses to houses, and it did have an impact. It did have a definite impact. After the election, there were more Muslim candidates elected under the banner of Alliance Les Pep than there were under the MMM uh, Labour Party alliance. This is the truth. They, they had six Muslim MPs, we had only five. So it worked. So then, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, today, not a word of best loser. Not a word about best loser. We are abolishing best loser system. And we're surprised that certain people don't trust political leaders. And really, we should have, been see, we should have seen it coming, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir. Because only one month after the government took office, only one month in the government program 2015-2019, achieving meaningful change, the address of the President of the Republic of Mauritius, what we call the discours de trône, on the 27th January 2015. Paragraph 264. Our electoral system would be reformed to introduce a dose of proportional representation in the National Assembly and guarantee better women representation. Not a word on best user. They have just won the election. They have just campaigned to maintain the best user. They come first opportunity to show their program one month later. Not a word on maintaining the best user system. And you'd really want some people in Mauritius, some section, some community, to have faith in all political leaders to ensure fair and adequate representation. Sir Speaker, sir, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, the Honourable Vice Prime Minister and also the Honourable Attorney General mentioned that we have to do away with the best user system because of the ruling by the United Nations Human Rights Committee and the action of resistance and alternative. They're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. There has, since that decision, there is a big uncertainty about the future of the best user system. But that was as far back as 2012. That was before the election. That was before 2014. So if before 2014, they had already agreed they already knew that they would have to do away with best user. Why go to an election and, you know, fool a section of the community? Sir so Deputy Speaker, sir, I intervened in 2004 on the Constitutional Amendment Bill. And when I intervened on that bill, 2014, yes, that was a mini amendment. When I intervened on that bill, I was very much conscious of the implication of the decision of the United uh, Nations Rights Committee and the case lodged by Resistance and Alternative. And this is what I said, and I quote, we must resolve politically any issue relating to the best loser system. We must bring electoral reform. And it is for us politicians, it is for us members of the National Assembly to bring electoral reform and not wait for us to be dictated by the Supreme Court or by the Privy Council. But I also went on to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, but let me reassure honorable members of this House and the population at large that the MMM will never, never agree, no vote, any electoral reform if it is not to enhance democracy while assuring a fair representation of all the components of our rainbow nation. Unfortunately, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, the bill before the House today falls short of ensuring a fair and adequate representation of all the components of our rainbow nation, and I will vote against it. Thank you. Honourable Lord, now.